probably one of the biggest challenges that people with autism have, people with Asperger's syndrome, high-functioning autism, however you want to phrase it, one of the greatest challenges we have is socializing because we just don't, we don't get it. We don't understand it because it's just not part of our hard wiring, literally not part of our brain as I understand it. It's called mind blindness, but does that mean we have to live the rest of our lives in the dark, so to speak, where we cannot socialize at all? We just don't have any connection whatsoever. Well, that's kind of obviously not true, at least for most of us. Well, I have here some ideas, some suggestions that you might want to take to heart in how to up your game socially. Now, here I am, nearly seven years old, 70, 70 years old, not seven years old, nearly 70 years old. And over the decades, you know, I've learned a thing or two, just trying to share with others some of the things that I've learned. And one of the things that I have I have not learned is how to socialize well. I just never could do it. I couldn't get the hang of it. I just don't somehow fit in. But I've been able to improve or up my game. So here's some of my ideas. Number one is just be real. Another way to say that, I think, is just be yourself. By that, I mean Masking, you know what I'm talking about. What I'm saying, masking, we try to pretend that we are somebody else in trying to fool other people. And I guess if you're a good actor, and some people are really good actors, if you're an excellent actor, you could probably pull that off. Well, I can't pull it off. And even if I could, I'm not sure I want to live my life pretending to be somebody I'm not. Now, everybody, everybody mask a little bit to some extent. Because, well, if we acted like we felt all the time, it'd be kind of annoying. We would be uh, offensive. We don't want to go that to that extreme. But still, I think when particularly people with Asperger's syndrome, it's just too obvious when we're trying to mask. At least that's been my impression. And people pick up on that. And it's kind of like... Um, some people may be a little bit offended by it because it's like we're trying to fool them, but other people, and this has been the challenge that I've encountered, it's kind of like they, they love ripping off your mask. You know, they like to pop the bu bubble, so to speak, and they want to see the real you because, well, they feel superior, so they want to take that mask off. So, you know, I just don't wear the mask to begin with, other than outside of just being kind of courteous. And what I do is instead of wearing the mask, I try to improve my real social skills. I mean, the real me. I learn to talk to people. I learn not to be so self-conscious when I'm interacting with others. Again, I know that's not an easy thing to do. And here I am all these decades, and I don't have it anywhere near perfected. It's kind of obvious. You can ask just about anybody that I encounter. They'll tell you, you know, eh, he's a little bit odd, but whatever. I'm happy being who I am. Number two is this. And this one is, for me, really, really effective, and it's really, really important. And that is think, then speak. So we really need to work on being articulate, at least I do. But I find that when I'm around other people, I just talked about this, I think, maybe yesterday, the day before. But uh, when I'm around other people, there is something about just being in their presence that scrambles my brain. You know, I could be very logical, organized thinking right up to the point where I'm in somebody's face or, you know, within within shouting distance. To me, that's in their face. So uh, my brain begins to scramble and I'm no longer thinking logically. And when I talk, well, what comes out is scrambled talk. You know, it just doesn't sound correct even even when I'm talking to you, sometimes you hear that uh, I scramble my words. I do that almost every video a little bit, not so much as I do in real life. But the way that I've learned to overcome that, not totally, but by and large, is before I open my mouth, I stop and think. Then I stop to consider. This person has scrambled my brain. They didn't do it intentionally. They can't help but to do it, but they have scrambled my brain. So I'm going to take a moment. And I'm going to 
take a deep breath maybe, I'm going to relax, I'm going to be conscious, cognitive of the fact that my brain is scrambled, and I'm going to give myself a second to get my thoughts organized. Does that work? Well, it helps. I mean, it doesn't work every time. The problem is when you talk, you know, as an SB or person with autism, when you talk and that scrambled talk comes out, people think you're weird. And to them, uh, I guess you are kind of weird. But even after I stop and think before I speak still, it doesn't always come out right. But I do my best, and I've found that... Um, excuse me, I had to hit the mute button while I coughed. But still, I find that it really helps to collect my thoughts so that I'm not as self-conscious in the presence of other people. And I think it is that self-consciousness that causes the scramble. So that's how you overcome that, at least for me. Number three, here's another idea. Express measured curiosity. Now, we've kind of covered this in other videos now and again. And uh, there's one thing that really bothers me. It's when somebody starts a conversation and their idea of a conversation is to... Um, quiz me about my personal life. It's kind of like you're being interrogated. What's your name? Where do you live? What is your address? What do you do for a living? Oh, you're retired. Well, what did you do for a living? Oh, that's fascinating. How did that work? How many kids do you have? What's your wife's name? Do you have a wife? Uh, do you have a dog? Yeah, what? What? You know, this is personal information. You know, I'm kind of waiting for them to ask for my social security number. Do you have a driver's license? What's your driver's license? You know, I'd no, I don't want people asking me that. So I learned if I don't like it, I'm guessing other people don't like it as well. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people do like you to quiz them and interrogate them about their personal life. But to me, it's kind of annoying. So what I've learned to do is don't do that. You know, now you want to show some curiosity. You know, maybe ask them, um, you know, what kind of work do you like doing or whatever, something like that. So once you get over that initial uh, inhibition to talk and now you can actually let some speech flow show a little bit of interest in the people and if you don't want to get real personal just compliment you know nice hat you're wearing there that's assuming they're wearing a hat if they're wearing a toupee you probably don't want to mention it uh that's not the type of uh measured curiosity that's over that's too much of a measure but yeah you can say hey cool you know nice nice shirt you're wearing or something like that I uh, wish I had one like that, and uh, maybe, who knows, maybe they'll give you the shirt off their back. Number four is, uh, I've, I've had a real problem with this one, particularly when I was younger, but number four is just mind your manners. The way that I learned my manners is, uh, you know, my parents never sat me down and said, you know, this is the fork, this is the spoon, this is how you behave at the table. They just, um, I just mimicked them. They had pretty good manners, you know. And I picked up most of what I learned from just observing and mimicking, aping, if you want to say that. And uh, some of the things I didn't pick up, my dad had some uh, odd ways of saying words. For example, he, instead of saying oil, he would say oral. Uh, yeah, I didn't pick up on that. Apparently, I had influence from other people, but I guess I did pick up that Midwestern accent. People tell me that I'm from Texas. I'm not from Texas, but I, apparently I sound like it. But, yeah, you pick up on things like that. You learn manners from other people, but sometimes you don't learn all your manners or you don't learn them correctly. Or you try to be cute. That's what I did when I was younger. I uh, tried to be, um, you know, personable. And with kids, you know, you get away with this. You, know, you can kind of insult each other with your mama jokes, and uh, we all think it's funny. But when you do that with an adult, you're, uh, no, don't do that. Now, as an adult, you certainly want to, don't want to do it with anyone, kids, adults, whatever. So the way that I like to think of this is if somebody were to ask me that, how would I respond? Sometimes that's not a very good test because I'd be okay with it. But by and large, I'm thinking, how would I respond? And if you stop and consider, how would they respond if I say this? Okay, that just brings another thought to mind. I got to say this. Uh, sometimes we become so self-conscious trying to follow the rules that uh, it doesn't work, you know. I know when I like to do public speaking, I don't know, I've given speeches or sermons, whatever you want to call them, thousands and thousands of times. Okay, hundreds and hundreds and well over a thousand, uh, a few thousand. But um, 
one of the big challenges when you go to a class on public speaking is they have all these stupid rules and you become so obsessed with the rules that your 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 speaking your speech just sounds canned it sounds flawed because you're all tight and tense and trying to say it just the right way i remember some of the things they say is you never beat on the podium um i like to beat on the podium you know i don't beat on it with my fist because it hurts my hands but i'll slap it sometimes and they say you never walk around when you speak you just stay behind the podium or whatever it is uh technically a podium podium means foot means the thing you stand on but most people think of a lectern as the podium I don't know who made that stupid rule, you know? Yeah, I don't follow that. When I do public speaking, I pace back and forth because I learned very early when you move around, you attract the eye. And if you can keep a person's eye, you can keep their ear. So the point that I'm making is this. As we go through these nine things, keep in mind that if you're trying really hard to follow these principles or these suggestions or these ideas, whatever you want to call them, it could actually be self-defeating. So just think of these as kind of ideas, and you might want to integrate them a little bit in your social life. But number four is mind your manners. So if there's any of them you're going to stick to, or number one, maybe I should have made this number one. Is, yeah, do that one. Mind your manners. Number uh, where are we? Number five is be lighthearted. Now, something I've noticed about most people with Asperger syndrome they're funny people. I mean, they have a sense of humor. Not all of them. You know, there are exceptions to everything. But there's something about the way these people think. And, uh, you know, they don't really think linearly. They linearly, I don't even know if that's a word, but they think outside the box. And that's where humor comes from. Now, I don't know that I'm a particularly funny person. I do know this. When I try to be funny, I'm not. And that's kind of funny. But, uh, yeah, but people with autism didn't have a good sense of humor. But even if you don't, you can be lighthearted or, you know, not lightheaded, but lighthearted or at least lighten up a little bit. Don't be so tense. Um, you know, tight expression on your face. And again, you can be too obsessed with some of these things, but, you know, just try to try to lighten up a little bit and make people feel at ease around you. And the best way to do that is feel at ease around yourself. Number six is to be positive and upbeat. Uh, that's, let's, let's frame it this way. Don't be negative and don't be downbeat. I don't even know if downbeat is a thing, but if you're always critical and negative, that's frustrating. You know, I know that I've been in line, say, at McDonald's, whatever, and you're waiting in line, and it's taking time, and the guy behind you is mad because he has to wait in line, and he's grumbling about how bad the service is. And you look at these people working, and they're working really hard. I mean, I've worked fast food before, and I know how challenging it could be, particularly when you're shorthanded. And this guy's griping. He's not helping anything. You've been in the line of the grocery store, you know, those self-checkout things. And the guy behind you wants everyone to hurry up. Now, when he gets up there, he doesn't hurry up. You know, he probably has a million coupons. But the point is, that's not a pleasant personality. That's not something that scores social points. That's not something that endears you to other people. Well, some people it would. But by and large, the guy who is just totally negative and critical and uh, has this little cloud, thunder cloud on his head, uh, over his head, uh, that's not... I don't think. Anyhow, that's not a way to score social points. Number uh, number seven is be empathetic. In other words, just care about people and express that concern. Uh, again, you can overdo it. You can mask it. You know, you can pretend, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And it sounds like you're being sarcastic. But if you let people know what that um, you're, you're a nice person. Now, it's challenging to be nice particularly when you have Asperger's syndrome, because a lot of times it is that empathy, that effective empathy, that affection, that niceness that makes us so gullible and so vulnerable because people see niceness as a weakness. So they take advantage of us, but still. What I want to do is I want people to understand that uh, I'm not a bad guy. I can be if I need to be. Uh, I'm just going to kind of mirror you a little bit. Number eight is be confident. 
I'm pausing here because I'm trying to think, you know, just how difficult and challenging that really is for people with uh, people who are autistic to be confident. Uh, it's really difficult for them. Now, some people I know with Asperger's, they just go overboard with uh, confidence to the point where they're obnoxious. And a lot of people think all Aspies are like that when really just a very few are, but still, um, don't go overboard with it. But uh, this comes back to that very first thing we were talking about, second thing we were talking about, when you stop and think, you know, collect your thoughts, collect your thoughts, that's it. So you display confidence when somebody tries to uh, dismiss you or belittle you. You're not thrown off your game. You're just confident. You know, what's the expression? Don't let them see you sweat. Number nine is this. Try to get a response out of people. Try to get them to maybe mirror you. You can do that by asking sensible questions, not silly questions. We talked about that before, you know, grilling people. Or if you're at the workplace, don't ask how to do things if it's kind of obvious how to do it because you just kind of look like you're dumb. But engage people, you know, with questions or whatever you have to do to get a response. And sometimes, sometimes you can make a game out of it or you do things where you try to get people to mimic you. You know, not always easy to do, but uh, they will do it eventually, sometimes. I know decades ago, I had this bad habit of, well, it wasn't a bad habit, just a habit of saying, holy cow. I don't know why, I just, uh, so I heard it somewhere and a lot of people heard it. So I started saying, oh, holy cow this and holy cow that. Next thing I knew, people around me started saying it. That, that's odd. Um, but, you know, people were, I was leading people. I was influencing people, didn't even intend to do it. But uh, then years later, I met this guy. And he was just really religious. I mean, just really religious. And he said amen all the time. Didn't even, didn't even make sense. He'd say amen. How you doing? Amen. I, you know, but what I noticed, uh, I asked him about that. And he said, yeah, it's just a habit he has. And then he told me that uh, one time, this guy was an engineer, but sometime, one time he was um, on a road trip with his boss, with a supervisor. Apparently they were visiting a client and looking at whatever they needed to look at to make some kind of analysis or whatever. And he said his, uh, his, his supervisor, who was anything but religious, you know, just didn't even intend to, but he found that uh, his supervisor started saying, started saying, amen. So, you know, I probably get along good with that guy. He'd say, amen. I'd say, holy cow. He'd say, well, amen. I'd say, well, holy cow. There we go down the road. But those are some things that, um, you might want to take to heart, you might want to consider. Uh, I don't give a lot of advice, but I have ideas, I have suggestions, and you can take them for what they're worth. And if you want to hear more, we have more. And all you have to do is um, click on one of those two rectangles coming up on the screen. We'll keep hanging out together. But if not, thanks for stopping by, and we will see you all next time.